Hello, our viewers. On our previous discussion, we have tried to revise the main concepts of grade 11 concepts. We have tried to see the different um, techniques, how to solve different problems on grade 11s. From this lesson on, we are going to revise some of the main points on grade 12 concepts. In grade 12, we have main four topics that are going to be appear in your national exam or entrance exam. So we are going to see about the concept of thermodynamics for today. So what does it mean by uh, thermodynamics? After the accomplishment of this thermodynamics concept, you are able to define the term thermodynamics and some basic terms like atoms, moles, molar mass, thermal equilibrium, and so on. You are able to state the basic laws of thermodynamics, the zeroth law of thermodynamics, third law, first law, and second law of thermodynamics. As well, you are able to solve problems concerning on first law of thermodynamics. First, let's try to define some of the key points. What does it mean by thermodynamics? Well, thermodynamics is one of the oldest branches of physics which deals about heat and temperature associated with different forms of energies or other forms of energies, like heat energy associated with mechanical energy, heat energy associated with um, electrical energy, it might be associated with chemical, nuclear, and so on. But mainly, we concern in this unit in grade 12, heat energy associated with mechanical energy or mechanical work. That is what we are focusing on. And thermodynamics, the term thermodynamics came from Greek words, which means thermi is heat and dynamics or dynamics is power. So that the term itself, thermodynamics, is concentrated on heat power associated with other forms of energy. It's also possible to define thermodynamics as the study of macroscopic property of a system. It mainly concerns on the macroscopic properties of a system, which means a given system might have different properties. We can categorize those properties as macro and microscopic properties. What when we mean by macro, it means that the property describes the system as a whole. Like volume, for example, volume describes the system as a whole rather than describing the single particle. Actually, the single particle has a volume, but the volume is negligible. And microscopic properties are properties like um, which describe the individual particles found in a system. For example, speed, you might take speed. Speed uh, describes the individual particles in a given system. So we should have to define what a system is. System is anything which is going to be investigated or studied is known to be system. Actually, system in physics, it can be from a very elemental particles to that of uh, celestial or universe particles, huge particles like galaxies can be considered as a system or a particle in physics. So anything which is bounded in a given boundary and has a definite particles can be considered as a system. Here you have a boundary and the definite particles in it so that this is a system, and everything outside the system is known to be surrounding. The system and the surrounding in combination makes the universe as a whole. So system and surrounding can interact to each other through the exchange of matter and energy. So energy might be in or out of the system, or matter may be in or out of the system. So the two forms, matter and energy, may in or out of the system. This is interaction way of the system and the surrounding. Actually, when you mean by energy, we are focusing on the two forms of energy. And these are heat and the other form of energy is mechanical energy or mechanical work performed on the system or by the system. Actually, depending on the boundary, it's possible to classify system into three as open system, closed system, and uh, isolated system. So open system is a system in which there is both matter and energy interaction. Closed system, there is only energy interaction. There is no any uh, matter interaction. Whereas isolated system is a system in which neither energy nor matter exchange is allowed between the system and surrounding. That means the system is totally isolated from the surrounding, no energy in or out of the system. One of the good examples of the isolated system is the universe itself. 
So far we know that there is a single universe, so that the universe contains its own energy and matter, so the matter and the energy is conserved. No matter and energy exchange from any other place, so we have a single universe. And here we have similar term which says that insulator system, later we call this to be adiabatic system, a system which does not allow energy exchange in the form of heat is known to be insulator system. So don't confuse this with that of isolator system. Isolator system does not allow neither energy nor matter exchange. Whereas insulated system, it allows us energy exchange with other forms, but not heat, okay? No heat in or out of the system. Property of a system, as I said earlier, it's possible to classify it as macro and micro. Macro describes the system as a whole, whereas micro describes the individual particles found in a system. Therefore, our main concern under thermodynamics is to study about the macroscopic property of a system. That means we are trying to study about volume, we are trying to study about pressure, temperature, heat, mechanical work, and so on. So, our main concern is this one, and trying to relate with that of the microscopic properties. Like, for example, temperature might be correlated with that of uh, kinetic energy, since temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. So that kinetic energy is a microscopic property which describes the property of the individual particles. So that this and this might be related. So that we are trying to study mainly focus on the macroscopic properties. Microstates of a system, meaning it's possible to investigate a system as a micro or atomic level. Atom is actually the smallest entity of um, uh, or particles of a given matter or a structure or a system. So atoms are the smallest entity of a particle. And therefore, when you are trying to investigate about particles in a system, there are basic terms like mole, molar mass, number of particles, and so on. So mole is the measure of amount of substance, meaning that one mole is equivalent to that of 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23 particles. And this is a well-known number known to be Avogadro's number. So one mole is equivalent to that of 6.0 times 10 to the power of 23 particles here. For example, if you have one mole of oxygen, meaning that there are how many oxygens in that system? 6.0 times 10 to the power of 23 oxygen atoms are found in the system. And to determine the number of particles in a given system, here we have mole, meaning it is the number of particles found in a single mole. Whereas number of particles tries to measure the number of total particles found in a given system. So that suppose here you have a system or a structure. Suppose here we have n number of particles so that the number of particles becomes number of Avogadro's or 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23 so that we have one mole. Now, again we are able to count another number of particles and if it is 6.02 times 10 to the power of 23 we have another mole. Suppose if you have two moles, two mole in this system, how many number of particles are there? So to find the number of particles, it's so easy. If you have two mole, in one mole, we have 6.0 times 10 to the power of 23 particles. Therefore, multiplying the number of Avogadro with that of number of mole gives us the total number of particles. So it says that the total number of particles is equal to number of mole times number of Avogadros. So the other point here is we should have to define laws of, we should have to state laws of thermodynamics. Under thermodynamics, we have four basic laws. And these are known to be the zero's law of thermodynamics, zero's law of thermodynamics, third law of thermodynamics, first law of thermodynamics, and the second law of thermodynamics. Each laws are very powerful laws, and they are trying to relate with their own uh, basic Concept. For example, zero's law is associated with that of temperature. It's sometimes known to be the law of temperature or thermal equilibrium. Third law is associated with that of absolute zero, and sometimes in chemistry it's known to be the perfect crystalline. And first law is associated with that of the law of conservation of energy or the law of internal energy. Whereas second law of thermodynamics, one of the most powerful law in the universe and which governs the universe is second law of thermodynamics and it's the law of entropy or known to be the law of irreversibility. So we'll try to see each law one by one. First let's try to see zero's law of thermodynamics. Zero's law of thermodynamics is the law of 
it thermal equilibrium or the low temperature and it says that if two bodies are in thermal equilibrium with the third body separately then it's possible to say that the two bodies are also in thermal equilibrium suppose here you have three bodies let's say that a and b are two distinct of bodies and here you have third intermediate body suppose you brought c onto a and found that the two bodies are in thermal equilibrium and again when you brought c onto b again you have found that the two bodies are in thermal equilibrium so you can conclude that a and b are also in thermal equilibrium well to understand the concept of zero's law of thermodynamics first you should have to define what does it mean by thermal equilibrium thermal equilibrium is a term it's a comparative term which tries to compare two things so that two bodies are said to be in thermal equilibrium if and only if they have the same temperature or if the net heat exchange between the two bodies is zero actually that's why it's called zero's law of thermodynamics it's called zero's law of thermodynamics because that the net heat flow between the two bodies becomes zero so that suppose here you have two bodies call it x and y at the beginning if the temperature of x is greater than temperature of y so that there will be heat flow from x to y but soon after as they reach into equilibrium the temperature of x and temperature of y becomes equal so that there is no net heat exchange between the two bodies the net heat exchange between the two bodies becomes zero so that this law tells us about a situation where the net heat flow is zero between the two bodies so that's why it's called zero's law of thermodynamics therefore two bodies are said to be in thermal equilibrium one if the net heat exchange between them is zero so that you can conclude the temperature between the two bodies is the same so keeping this in your mind now look if you brought c onto a and if you find that the net heat exchange between a and c is zero you can conclude that temperature of a and temperature of c are equal again if you brought c onto b and if, suppose that you find that the net heat exchange between b and c is zero so you can conclude that temperature of b and temperature of c are equal so what would happen if you brought b onto a that's the question that's what zero's law of thermodynamics states if you brought b onto a the net heat exchange between a and b is also zero and you can conclude that the temperature of a and temperature of b are also equal this is what zero's law of thermodynamics states and it's a very powerful law concerning on temperature the third law of thermodynamics states about the absolute zero for a given system to have a net zero temperature or net heat flow is zero since temperature is associated with that of movement of particles the movement of every particles stops or ceases at exactly negative 273.15 degrees celsius or this concept is known to be this point is known to be zero kelvin zero kelvin so zero kelvin or negative 273.15 degrees celsius is known to be absolute zero and it is impossible to achieve this absolute zero under any finite step so third law of thermodynamics states about that it's impossible to achieve absolute zero under any finite step so this value is determined from mathematical interpolation on volume versus temperature graph it's not actually a practical number but it is derived from a mathematical interpolation so at this point at this point this is known to be absolute zero zero kelvin is known to be absolute zero absolute zero at this point the movement of every particle even a single particle hydrogen will cease at this point and this point is known to be absolute zero and this cannot be achieved practically that is what it says no object can reach a temperature of absolute zero under a finite number of steps this is what the third law of thermodynamics states in chemistry we do have another definition that every particles cannot have a perfect crystalline uh, something like this okay so you can study furthermore and now let's try to see the first law of thermodynamics so far we have seen about zero's law of thermodynamics then we have seen about the third law of thermodynamics and now let's try to see about first law of thermodynamics first law of thermodynamics is also known to be the law of conservation of energy or sometimes known to be the law of internal energy 
And this law states that the change of the internal energy between the change of the internal energy of a given system appears due to two factors. And these are due to the heat transfer either in or out of the system. And the other factor is the mechanical work performed on or by the system. This is what it says. Okay, mathematically it's possible to express first law of thermodynamics as the change of internal energy, it's symbolized as U, is equal to the heat Q, so heat is symbolized as Q, sometimes plus or minus. There are different sign conventions actually. There might be books which strictly follow plus sign, or there might be a books which use the change of internal energy is equal to Q minus W, okay? There are different conventions. We'll try to see that later. But in this case here, it says that the change of internal energy of a given system, a given system, is due to the heat transfer in the work done. Okay? That are the two factors we are going to deal. In some other topics, you might consider about chemical energy, electrical energy, nuclear energy. But our main concern is heat and mechanical work. That's all. What do you mean by internal energy? First, let's try to define what does it mean by internal energy. Internal energy is the sum total of energy associated with the molecular interactions. Like when two molecules are interact, they might have potential energy, electrical energy, nuclear energy, and so on. But our main concern is when the two particles collide to each other, that's the only thing that we need, kinetic energy. We don't need potential energy, electrical energy, chemical energy, and nuclear energy. We'll just avoid that so that we are mainly concerned only the kinetic energy. So the system is entirely constituent of only kinetic energy. We are focusing on the movement of particles. They are randomly moving and colliding with each other. That's all. No chemical interaction, no electrical interaction. So the sum total of these different forms of energy is known to be internal energy, but on our concern, of a system is there is only kinetic energy. Keeping that in your mind, what does it mean by heat? Well, heat is one form of energy in transient, which is flows from a given object to the other object due to a difference in temperature. So that it is energy which is associated due to the movement of particles, and that is associated as the difference in temperature allows us the direction of flow of heat. So it's what it says. And then it's possible to transmit heat in different methods. We'd have conduction, convection, and radiation, and so on. Conduction needs a physical contact between the hotter and colder bodies. Convection needs fluids, it might be liquid or gas. It's a means of heat flow due to the displacement of fluids. Whereas radiation is a means of energy flow in the form of heat mm, between distant objects due to electromagnetic pulse. For example, the sun uh, sent energy in the form of heat due to electromagnetic pulse towards the Earth. Okay, this is what it says. Since heat is one form of energy, its SI unit is joule, but it's also possible to use a common um, measuring unit known as calorie. One calorie is equivalent to that of 4.2 joule. Here we have another law which is concerned as the law of conservation of energy. Previously, first law of thermodynamics is also known to be the law of conservation of energy. And here we, we have also another law which is associated with the law of conservation of energy. It's known to be the law of heat exchange. Suppose if you have two bodies, hotter and colder body, the hotter body might lose some amount of energy in the form of heat towards a colder body. So the amount of the energy lost by the hotter body should be equivalent to that of the amount of energy gained by the colder body. This is what it says. And this is a concept of, concept, concept of law of conservation of energy. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. Rather, it transfers from one object to the other object. So heat loss by hotter body is the same as heat gained by the colder body. And this is known to be the law of heat exchange. And when you consider about the work done, here let's take our system to have a piston, a movable piston, so that you can compress the piston downward with a force F, and it might be displaced a displacement of H, H or change in H. So that work can be given as force times displacement, but we know that force over cross-sectional area is known to be pressure P, so that when you substitute here, you can find that 
instead of force, you can have pressure times area times the displacement S or change in H, P times change in H. Area times the change in H gives us the change in volume, change in volume, so that the mechanical work then performed on the system might be, or it might expand so that it might be work done by the system. Actually, as the object is expanding, as the object is expanding, it's known to be work done by the system. Whereas, as it is compressed, it's known to be work done on the system, on the system, so that this is our equation. And note that the pressure is constant. And delta V, or change in V, means the final volume minus the initial volume. So it's possible to use this equation to determine the work performed on or by the system. Then let's try to see about thermodynamics process. Process is actually a situation which shows us how does a given initial condition transmitted or transferred to the final state. So that in thermodynamic system, suppose if you have a thermodynamic system, it changes its initial state after sometimes it reaches to that of the final state. How does it change its initial state? For example, here the system might have initial pressure, initial volume, initial temperature, and so on. So that it transferred to the final pressure, to the final volume, and to the final temperature. So that how does it convert from the initial state to the final state, so that it is known to be thermodynamic process. Actually, depending on the three thermodynamic variables on pressure, volume, and temperature, we can have four main um, thermodynamic process. And these are known to be isobaric, isochoric, isothermal, and adiabatic process. So we'll try to see each one by one. And note that here we'd have a very important graphical expression for thermodynamic process, actually for um, as well as it's possible to determine the mechanical work, it's possible to determine the state or condition of a thermodynamic system. Therefore, on a pressure versus volume diagram, on a PV diagram, if you have a point, the point refers to that of a state or condition. For example, if you draw downward, you can find the volume. If you transmit here, you can find the pressure. And using the concept of PV, is equal to nRT, it's possible to determine temperature T as the product of pressure volume over the number of mole times R, okay? So at a single point, you can find the pressure, you can find the volume, you can find the temperature. So it tells us about the state or the condition of a given thermodynamic system. So point refers to state. Whereas lines or curves between two points, suppose if you have a line here, or a curve here, the curve states that which type of process it takes place. So lines or curves refers to a thermodynamic process, whereas area under each curve or each line refers to that of a mechanical work performed on or by the system. So to revise once more, point refers to state, lines refers to that of thermodynamic process, whereas Area refers to that of a thermodynamic mechanical work performed on or by the system. Therefore, let's try to see each process one by one. Isobaric, first let's try to see isobaric. Iso means the same, baric means pressure. So isobaric means the same pressure. So in this case, here you have a system, and this system tends to change from initial state to the final state, keeping the pressure constant. On a PV diagram, horizontal lines refers to that of isobaric lines. And when you apply first law of thermodynamics for isobaric process, you have the change in the internal energy is equal to Q, either plus or minus. It's possible to have plus or minus the mechanical work. The work W for isobaric process can be given as P times the final volume minus the initial volume gives us change in volume. Here we use minus or plus. When do we use minus and when do we use plus? Well, when you use minus, it means that the system is tending to perform work or it's expanding. When you use minus, it means that it's expanding. So whenever you read any question, when it says expanding, work is done by the system, you should have to use a minus sign, okay? And if it is compressed on or work performed on the system, you should have to use the plus sign. 
So the plus sign is for work done on the system or for compression. The minus sign tells you work is done by the system or it might be expansion. Keep that in your mind and note that the horizontal line refers to that of isobaric line. This tells us isobaric expansion, whereas if the line is changing like this, it's isobaric compression. Since the volume is decreasing, it's known to be isobaric compression. The other process is isochoric. It's also known to be isovolumetric. Isovolumetric means changing a given initial condition to the final condition, keeping the volume constant. The volume is constant so that the change in internal energy is equal to Q plus W, where W is known to be P times change in volume. And the change in volume is the final volume minus the initial volume. We know that the initial and the final volume are equal for isochoric process. If so, since they are equal, V final minus V initial gives us zero. There is no mechanical work performed on during a process, during isochoric process. So if there is no mechanical work done, how does the internal energy change? Well, the internal energy changes only due to the heat transferred in or removed out of the system. The internal energy increase when heat is absorbed by the system. And the internal energy might be decreased if it releases or expels heat out from it. So that keep this in your mind. Here, the vertical line refers to that of isochoric process. Whenever you have a vertical line, it is isochoric process. The pressure is increasing. When the curve is moving downward, the line is moving downward, the pressure is decreased, but the volume remains constant. So vertical lines refers uh, isochoric. Horizontal line refers to that of isobaric, as we have seen previously. Now let's try to see isothermal process. Isothermal process is a process in which it changes its state, keeping the temperature constant. So during isothermal process, Every point here remains or have the same temperature, meaning, as I said earlier, temperature can be determined as the product of pressure volume over NR. For example, if you have a number here, 2, and if you have here, like 12, 12 times 2 gives us 24. So the temperature in this case becomes 24 over NR. And suppose at some point here, let's say that it is um, 4, so that the pressure is 6. So 6 times 4, again, it gives us 24 over NR. You see, at every point, at the initial point and at the final point, even though the pressure in the volume changes, one thing doesn't change, the product of the two. Meaning, the product of the two is temperature. Temperature remains constant, so that it gives you a horizontal curve, a flatter curve like this one. And if a system is isothermal, meaning that the internal energy does not change. Because that temperature initial is equal to temperature final, change of internal energy is associated with that of, with that of um, internal energy is associated with temperature, like MC, delta T, later we'll try to see under kinetic theory of molecules, N times, uh, like 3 over 2 N times R delta T. So the change in internal energy associ associated with change of temperature. If the change of temperature is zero, it's possible to say that the change of internal energy is zero. The change of internal energy meaning zero. The internal energy is conserved. Okay? The final internal energy is equal to the initial internal energy. This is what it says. So if there is no change of internal energy, what would happen as heat is entered into the system? Well, as the heat entered, the temperature does not rise because that there will be a mechanical work performed uh, by the system. Suppose if heat is added to the system, the temperature of the system does not increase. Why? Because that it performs mechanical work. So this is what it says. The amount of the heat entered into the system is going to be out like a work, performing work. It does not increase the internal energy. Such a system is known to be isothermal process. Now let's try to see about adiabatic process. So far, isobaric, keeping the pressure constant, isochoric, keeping the volume constant, isothermal, keeping the temperature constant. But adiabatic states that none of them is constant. All varies. The pressure, the volume, the temperature changes. This is what it says. And the curve is somehow more steeper curve. Here, if you try to multiply those points, here, let's say if it is 2, and if it is 
12. When you multiply these two, at this instant point, it gives us 24 over nr. So that the temperature is this one. But when you came here, it might be like 4, and this might be like 4. So that when you multiply these two, it gives you 16 over nr. So at this point, the temperature are not equal. The pressure are not equal, as well as the volume are not equal. All the three variables change. And it's a curve which is found between two isothermal curves. And it's a very rapid process. Since it's very rapid, it has no time for absorbing heat or releasing heat so that the heat transfer is generally zero. So when you apply first law of thermodynamics for adiabatic process, the heat exchange is zero. So how does the internal energy increase or decrease? How does the internal energy changes? Well, the internal energy changes due to the mechanical work performed on the system or work might be performed by the system. So that the change of internal energy appears only due to the mechanical work performed on or by the system. So keep in your mind, so far we have seen the four uh, process, thermodynamic process. Now it's the time of activity. Let's try to solve one good example. A system expands from 2 meter cube to 5 meter cube constantly by 50 Pascal as it absorbs 350 Joule of heat energy. So it asks us what is the work then and the change of internal energy. So let's take that this is our system. Here you have a piston and here we have the system. The system absorbs heat or it absorbs energy in the form of heat it absorbs 350 Joule of energy. As it absorbs 350 Joule of energy, it starts to push the piston upward with a constant pressure of 50 Pascal. 50 Pascal. And it expands from initially 2 meter cube to that of finally 5 meter cube. So that the initial volume is 2 meter cube, the final is 5 meter cube. The pressure is 50 Pascal. We are asked what is the work performed. So to determine the work performed, P times delta V, as I said earlier, and delta V or change of volume is the final volume minus the initial volume. And we know that the final volume is five, the initial volume is two. So five minus two gives us three. Three times the constant pressure is 50. When you multiply this, you can determine 150 Joule of work is performed and it's expanding and it's work done by the system. Then to determine the change of internal energy, change of internal energy, it's possible to use Q and W. In this case, to use plus or minus, first check your question or your system. The system is expanding, so I should have to use the minus sign. I should have to use the minus sign. If the system was compressing or work is performed on the system, it's possible to use a plus sign. Okay, so in this case, since it is expanding, we are going to use the minus sign. And to determine the change of internal energy, the heat absorbed from the surrounding is 350 Joule minus the work performed by the system is 150. 150. So that when you are trying to subtract this, it gives us 200 Joule. 200 Joule. So the change of internal energy is 200 Joule. There is an increment in the internal energy by 200 Joule. It means, for example, initially, if it was 1,000 Joule, if the internal energy of the system is 1,000 Joule, by now it becomes 1,200. There is an increment of 200 Joule. So keep this in your mind. Now let's try to see about the kinetic theory of molecules. What does it mean by the kinetic theory of molecules? I hope from your grade 11 concept, we know that mechanics can be classified as kinetics and kinematics. Kinematics studies mainly concerning on the motion and motion variables. Whereas kinetics focus on the motion with force. Actually, kinetics itself further classified as statics and dynamics. So dynamics is a state result of the movement of particles or the movement of objects. So when you mean by kinetic theory of gas, we are trying to deal about motion and motion variables associated with their cause, with force and momentum and so on. The beginning concept of, at the beginning, the kinetic theory of molecules or gas was derived due to the Robert Brown, or a Scottish botanist, have found 
an experimental evidence that a pollen grain juggles or a pollen grain moves when he was, he was trying to observe through a microscope there was a zigzag movement of particles and the zigzag movement of particles due to the bombardment of neighboring molecules is known to be Brownian motion and that Brownian motion is a reason for the kinetic theory of molecules because that after the movement of the particles it's possible to study about the momentum the collision the kinetic energy, the velocity, and so on, so that you have a kinetic theory of molecules. When you mean by kinetic theory of molecules, you mean that we are investigating the microscopic view of the system, meaning we are going to in, we are going to investigate the properties of individual particles, like velocity, momentum, position, and so on, so that it's microscopic view, and trying to correlate with the macroscopic properties. Under this concept, here we have a system to investigate that. And let's take a monoatomic ideal gas. Monoatomic ideal gas, meaning a single atomic ideal gas. We are going to take a monoatomic ideal gas so that there is only a translational movement. The particles are tending to move here and there and colliding with each other with a linear motion. If we take diatomic molecules, actually, after uh, the translational motion, there might be a rotational motion. We are not going to consider a rotational, a vibrational, and so on. So we are going to see only the translational or the linear motion. That's why we are choose or we are taking the monoatomic ideal gas. So taking the monoatomic ideal gas in this perfect container, we have a basic assumptions under kinetic theory of molecules. What are those assumptions? We have five assumptions. One. The system is entirely consistent of only kinetic energy. The system has only kinetic energy. Okay? We don't have um, any additional energy with the molecules like electrical energy, chemical energy, and so on. We are going to avoid those energies and fix only on kinetic energy. And the other concept, or the second assumption is, as the molecules are randomly moving here and there, as the particles are moving randomly here and there, they are trying to collide with each other, then they are trying to collide with the wall. Okay? During that collision, the collision should be perfectly elastic so that the kinetic energy or the internal energy is conserved. So the second assumption states that the collision between the particles and the collision with the wall of the container is a perfectly elastic collision. This is what it says. The third assumption states that the particles are moving here and there with random velocity. Their velocity is different. But the average velocity of the particles are moving along the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis is going to be equal. Okay? The average velocity of the molecules of a system along each direction, meaning the average velocity of the particles along the x, y, and z remains constant. And instead of using x, y, and z, it's possible to use just v average. Okay? This is the third assumption. The fourth assumption states that the volume of a particle comparing to the volume of a system is negligible. So the volume of a particle is much, much less than that of the volume of a system. And volume is somehow a macroscopic property and should describe the system as a whole. And the volume of a particle is negligible. The fifth assumption is it is possible to use um, classical physics or Newtonian physics. Okay, we have Newton physics laws. It's possible to use force is equal to mass times acceleration. Rate of change of momentum to that of impact time is equal to force and so on. It's possible to use those laws. Okay? Um, actually, as the molecules are very small and tending to move with the speed of light, this physics that we know is, might be converted or we should have to use quantum mechanics. We should have to use that. But in this case, to study about the kinetic theory of molecules, it's possible to use this physics or classical physics or Newtonian physics. This is what it says. And then from this investigation, it's possible to drive the most four important equations. And these equations are, the first equation states that the velocity RMS, root mean square velocity of those particles is equal to three times the pressure of the system or pressure P over density rho. So the first equation is this one. Actually, we have different steps to uh, determine those equations. First, you should have to find the change of momentum, the impact time, the force, the pressure, and so on. We have different techniques. You have this concept on your books, but mainly focus on the result. So the result says that VRMS is equal to root of three times pressure P 
over rho. The second equation is the internal energy is 3 over 2 n r t. Okay, this is our second equation. In the third equation, the average kinetic energy is equal to 3 over 2 kT. This is true for monoatomic ideal gas. Actually, we are going to use, um, consider, if we have a diatomic gas, we, have, we should have to consider only the translational cases. Okay, so that you might use those numbers as well for diatomic or for polyatomic, considering only the translational motion. Here, something very important thing is temperature is associated with result of the average kinetic energy. So far, we have been defining that temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. This is what it says. So, this is the mathematical explanation that average kinetic energy is associated with temperature. And this temperature should be expressed in Kelvin. And it's known to be absolute temperature. Absolute temperature. Meaning temperature expressed in in Kelvin is known to be absolute temperature. And the last one is VRMS, root mean square velocity is equal to three times RT over molar mass, where R is the uh, universal gas constant or molar gas constant. So these are the four equations derived from kinetic theory of molecules, and you should have to solve some additional problems. Students, I think this is that I have got for today. Next time, we'll try to see about the concept of um, molar heat capacity and so on. So I'll see you then.